Acts is what is the world going to look like when Messiah comes back? And I'll give you a hint. The seat of government for the entire world is going to be right there on Messiah's shoulders, reigning from Jerusalem. So we're going to have one world government. And I can't speak to the currency, but I can certainly speak to the religion. Because Torah will become the law of this entire planet, of every kingdom they're in. So what we've been taught to fear, one world government and one world religion, is actually what the Bible tells us to hope for and look forward to. Hmm. Because that's what happens during the millennial reign of Messiah on this planet. So food for thought, the things that we're running around telling each other to fear, that's actually our hope. Wow. Yeah. That's and you know, that's that's interesting because that with end time prophecy, it seems you, you said something earlier, it's a carbon copy. The enemy has a carbon copy. Uh and, and I think I think that that's exactly, you know, exactly what causes all this fear is we get we can't discern between these two things that look almost identical. And, and so what happens is we are terrified of this idea of one world. And the reason is because the enemy knows that when the Messiah comes back, he will establish one world government. And so he's trying to get us afraid of it so that we will <laughs> oppose it and oppose the kingdom of Messiah. And now we have to set up our own idea of what kingdom is and our own nation and our, you know, and, and really it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like replacement theology in a, in a, in a very large worldwide scale where we are somehow we have this special understanding that that one world government's awful. Now, in granted, the 21st century, evil is now good, and good is now evil. And it sounds like maybe you might not have gotten the memo, but <laughs> the things which we're supposed to be looking forward to are now the things we're supposed to dread. Um, you know, our virtue is our national sovereignty. Um, you know, we won't let anybody take away our national sovereignty. But when we read Revelation, that's exactly what's happening. The kingdoms of this world are now the kingdoms of Yah. Um, that is global domination and occupation, to put it in you know, political and military terminologies. There you go. So it is the cessation of all national sovereignty, essentially, because every government is made to submit to one central, one world government, our Messiah. Hmm. That's really interesting. And and so we, we've got this, so we've got this fear now kind of exposed. People live in this fear of the mark, of the beast, of whatever it is, uh, whether it's real or, or not, they're, they're living in this fear of their, possibly even their fabrication of this stuff. Um, so, so now going into, we've got the mark of the creator. We've talked about this. We've talked about how it's his, it's his commandments, it's his instructions. Um, you know, there, there's places that call his Sabbath a mark, you know, so basically if you are following mm -hmm. his instruction, you know, you have, you have the, the mark of the creator. So Correct. now let's move, let's, let's shift here. So let's take that. That's our, that's our viewing glass here. Okay. So, so now we have a picture of the actual mark and let's, let's try to unravel this mark of the beast. So, so I want you to explain to people how, uh, you know, to avoid the RFID chip at, at all costs. Uh, <laughs> Personally, I would love an RFID chip. I'm a bit of a hacker. I'm definitely a techie. And a new piece of technology that I could hack and tear apart and see how it works. Uh, that sounds fantastic for me. But this RFID chip has been promised. Uh, you all remember reading the Facebook posts about, oh, how um, the Affordable Care Act legislation has... Uh, an item in there that says everyone's going to receive uh, an RFID chip under their skin in their right hand. But nobody ever saw a copy of this legislation, which has always been available on public government websites that anybody can go and click on and read in its entirety. But not once did anybody produce a copy of this. And now that Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, has been a matter of fact, for a couple of years now, um, if anybody's received their RFID chip already, you know, please, you know, jump in the chat window and let us know. I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get my hands on mine, but I, I guess you know my last <laughs> name starts with an L, and I guess they haven't gotten to me yet. 
but um, <laughs> you know, we're we're taught to worry about things. You know, this is like a magic trick. You know, I'm I'm showing you this hand. Don't pay attention to what my other hand's doing. You know, pay attention. Look, look. Pay attention to the little bird. Don't look over here. This is a distraction. So instead of actually understanding what the mark is and where it comes from and what it represents, we're you know all you know out on our in our watchtowers with our binoculars and we're looking in the wrong direction. We're looking at the government, but you know in the book of revelation it's all about worship it has nothing to do with civil government and identification systems and voter registration um if you read through the entire bible every time that our creator ever judged anybody any time he ever brought his wrath down on anybody guess what it never had to do with technology but it always had to do with worship and obedience so when we're talking about this mark We've already established the mark of the Father identifies worship, who we serve, and it identifies how we serve. It identifies law, and that defines our obedience. So when we get into Revelation, that's the book that has the most confusion in the Bible simply because that's the thing that we have the least amount of reference for. We don't have all of the necessary, you know, context of all of the imagery that's being used in that book. So we come up with just the most fantastic, and, uh, you know, I use that word as a, you know, a bit of a pun, I guess, but, you know, it, because it's pure fantasy, what we invent around the book of Revelation. Um, we've also been taught that the book of Revelation all happens in the last 3.5 years before we all get raptured away and go flying up into heaven with Kirk Cameron and leave our clothes behind. <laughs> that does not sound like a hope to me, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, we've been taught this, you know, non preteristic view of the book of Revelation. It's all in the future. And because of that, we don't really recognize the actual, you know, fact that that book started happening, you know, almost 2000 years ago. And most of that book is actually in our past. So we don't have to speculate about the future to understand revelation. What we need to do is study history. And just like when you look at Pharaoh's vision, and I know it sounds like I'm off on some crazy tangent, but I'm just trying to kind of fill in some background as fast as I can, because without at least a, a modicum of you know background, it's impossible to make heads or tails of any of this. But you remember when Joseph was in Egypt, Pharaoh had a dream, and in his dream, there were you know seven sickly cows and seven healthy cows. Then there were seven healthy stocks of corn, and then there were seven, you know, unhealthy, you know, hungry stocks of corn. And, you know, this wasn't two separate visions. This was two different perspectives on the exact same time frames. When we look at Revelation, again, we have four different um, perspectives on sevens. And the best way to interpret Revelation, if you look at the seventh, of each of these things, you're going to see a lot of very, very strong familiarity between these because they're all defining the same moment. And that's how we know that these don't happen in parallel. First the letters and then the trump or then the seals and then the trumpets and then the bowls. Rather, these are four different perspectives on the same time frame. Maybe they start at different periods or something like that. You know, there's speculation, but one thing's clear, if you look at the seventh of each of these, they're talking about the same thing. So they all have the same endpoint, and it's very logical to assume from scriptural precedent that they're all talking about the same seven periods. That being said, that would put us pretty squarely in the sixth period of Revelation. So now, you know, just establishing a, a bit of a framework for interpreting the book, we have this thing called a mark of the beast, and we have to understand what the beast is, first of all, because now we're going to know where to look to find the mark. Well, whenever we read about beasts in prophecy, such as in Daniel, uh, I believe chapter 7, it's talking about the exact same beasts that reappear in Revelation chapter 4. We've got a lion, we've got an eagle, we've got a leopard, and we've got a bear. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Well, these beasts, you know, these aren't demons, these aren't monsters, these aren't, you know, the, the things that you've been taught to be afraid of in horror movies. Beasts in prophecy in the Bible are typically nations. So what we're looking for here is nations, countries, cities, things like that. Um, kingdoms of man, if you will. Um, so we've got these beasts that are all separate in Revelation chapter 4. And then all of a sudden, when we look in Revelation chapter 13, we see that all, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 13 and 17. Now we see that all these beasts somehow turned into one beast. So this is uh, describing something like an empire or uh, a union of nations. Um, so now we've got this in Revelation 17. It gives us not just a good description of this conglomerate beast, but it also gives us angelic interpretation. We actually have an angel there communicating with John and explaining what some of this is. So we've got this mystery Babylon, this woman who's the mother of harlots, sitting on top of this terrifying looking beast. And John's as confused as you and I are. So he's saying, what is all of this? And the angel actually gives him a few clues. Well, the first thing, you know, he says, so you know, what, are, what are all these heads, you know, these seven heads that the, the woman's sitting on? And he says, well, actually, those seven heads are seven mountains that the woman is sitting on. Seven mountains, okay. I, I, that makes sense. Well, then what's the woman? And he said, well, actually, the woman is a great city that has influence over all the kings of the earth. So we're looking at a city that sits on seven mountains. And, of course, you know, everybody has turned every city that they didn't like into a city on seven mountains. Washington, <laughs> D.C., Rio de Janeiro. But back then, trying to put John's letter into John's context, there was only one city in the world that was known as the city on seven hills. That was Rome. So, you know, is it possible that it's Rome or am I just, you know, some really anti-Catholic guy? <laughs> well, the name of the woman, you know, that was written on her head was Mystery Babylon. So what is a mystery? Well, you know, we think of like a detective novel, like a whodunit, you know, like we're watching Scream and we're trying to figure out who it was. And then all of a sudden the killer comes out at the end and it's somebody who was never even introduced in the whole movie. And you're like, hey, give me my eight bucks back. Um, that's not the kind of mystery that's being used here. The word mystery refers to the Greco-Roman mysteries, which were the religions from 2000 years ago. Um, they had secretive religions, which they didn't really reveal their practices or beliefs and doctrines publicly. You had to join the mystery or the cult. And as you grew and stayed with them longer, more and more of it was revealed to you. So what a mystery is, is just a religion that, you know, maybe obfuscates some of its actual orthodoxy and orthopraxy. So then we have Mystery Babylon. Well, you know, this has something to do with Babylon. And, you know, we basically know what they worshipped in Babylon. They worshipped the heavenly bodies. Uh, if you actually study Babylonian religion, their gods' names changed, I mean, over and over again. You know, who was the father of the other one uh, a century later? You know, now the roles were reversed and, you know, the gender changed. Babylonian religion is a lot more complicated than what you see on Facebook. Oh, it's all about Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Um, you actually really have to dig into this, and it's completely convoluted. Um, I, I wish it was that simple. But, you know, so we've got a sun worshiping or, you know, worshiping of the heavenly bodies religion, which is, you know, sitting in Rome and is also the mother of harlots. Well, you know, if, if I am a religion and I have children, what are my children going to be? They're not going to be giraffes. They're going to be other religions. So if Rome is the mother of other religions, then these other religions would probably be best described as the 40,000 denominations of Christianity, hmm. which came out of Rome. So... When you actually look at the horns, the heads, and, you know, study some of these things out, 
what you'll see is a description of the Roman Empire breaking up in the um, in the vision 